right, folks, that's right, it's Brett Bigschwag Wagner, the host of Speed Channel's Pastime. And listen, when I need advice on life or anything else that's out there that's bothering me, I listen to the Bruce Collins Show. Why aren't you? Once upon a time, there lived a young boy named Bruce. What happened to that young boy? He became a major headache. Theater of the Mind. The Bruce Collins Show. Bruce Collins Show. With the Baron of Broadcasting. Bruce Collins. Collins. Transmission begins. Five, four, three, two, one. The Bruce Collins Show. A journey of the bizarre. Bizarre. The paranormal. Paranormal. The secretive. The secretive. And the unexplained. The unexplained. The unexplained. The new theater of the mind. The Bruce Collins Show. Welcome back to the Bruce Collins Show. We're very glad to have you join us. Tonight we will be talking to Nick Redfern. I always enjoy talking to Nick. However, this book, I have to totally disagree with his findings, even though they are fascinating. His book is very controversial. It's about the RH negative blood type and its alleged ties to the alien or Nephilim world. And of course, as a note of disclosure, as I said before, I do not agree with the findings of Nick's book. The Bruce Collins Show airs every Friday night at midnight right here at WWPR, 1490 AM. You can listen to past archives of The Bruce Collins Show at IPBN. Dash FM dot com. That's IPBN dash FM dot com. There's a banner just for the Bruce Collins show on the Intrepid Paradigm Broadcasting Network website. Click on the show banner and you will go right to our page. We would appreciate it if you're able to spread the word for our show by word of mouth, social media, or in whatever creative way you can. Also, we have a Facebook page for the Bruce Collins show. Please like us there. And you can email the show at Bruce underscore Collins underscore show at AOL.com. Drop us a line and let us know how you're doing. The Bruce Collins Show also has a YouTube channel. Visit YouTube, search for the Bruce Collins Show channel, subscribe, and catch all the latest shows on YouTube. And now let me introduce my co-host, Chad Miles. He's a former congressional candidate in Michigan and a military veteran, and is the founder and webmaster at Conspiria.net. Go to Conspiria.net and see what all the talk is about tonight. You can also find out more information on Chad at Chad Miles. He is radio's lethal weapon, Chad Miles. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Jump up in your seats for my co-host. Chad Miles. Yes, we've got a budget of $3 now for this program. Welcome back to the program, Chad. Wow, that was unexpected uh, and uh, surprising. Thank you. Yes, David Lee said he would do it on a moment's notice. I love I love him. We're, we're old friends. That's right. Down at the senior home. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Now, now I, I want to say thank you, of course, to the owner of IPBN-FM.com. His name is Rocky Stucci, but I like calling him Rocky Stucky. And I just can't believe that his parents gave him four C's in his name, Rocky Stucky. And by the way, also, talking about past uh, friends of this show, I just want to say hi to Father Jack Ashcraft. Now, how you doing, Chad? I've been doing great. You know, I'm just uh, sitting back, relaxing, and uh, giving Senior Pickles his flea bath. 
giving Senior Pickles his flea bath. Yeah. Sounds like a song. Now, when you give his him his flea bath, may I suggest holding his head under the water for about five minutes? Hey, he would have drowned if I did that. You wouldn't want me to do that, would you? Eh, does Jimmy Carter have teeth? I'm not sure I know what you mean. Well, anyway, I've invited my cousin, Colin S. Collins, back on the show tonight. People may remember his big splash on our on our other side project, The Revolving Door, and then I brought that audio onto the Bruce Collins Show a couple of weeks ago. Colin S. Collins, the poet who knows it. There. Oh, no, really? Come on. Why wasn't I consulted about this? I just told you right now, Chad, you have a short memory. You've got that old timers, along with David Lee Roth. Anyway, Colin, welcome back to the show. Thank you, gentlemen. I have written a poem for this occasion. Oh, no, not another poem. Chad, don't you start. We're honored to have such a distinguished poet as my cousin on the program. Go ahead, Colin. In a faraway land, there's a man named Chad. There's also a Bigfoot named Harry. Can you believe that? A hairy Bigfoot. Between the two of these awful beasts, Chad is much more scary. I love it. (laughs) That was so succinct. Oh, that was terrible. It sounded like what? some sort of horrible nursery rhyme. Why, yes, I do draw inspiration on ancient myths of folklore. For instance, I like the story of Hansel and Gretel. Hansel and Gretel went up the hill, and Hansel fell down the hill. When Gretel got home, she said to her mom, Look, Ma, no Hans! <laughs> hey, w- wait a minute. I thought that was Jack and Jill that went up the hill. That's what the media wants you to think, silly. YouTube has a real story. It was Hansel and Gretel. Check it out. I agree with Colin, I have to say. I've spent plenty of wasted hours on YouTube, and I've researched the whole Jack and Jill conspiracy for years. Oh, c- come on. That sounds pretty bizarre to me. Well, you know what they say. Fiction is stranger than truth. Yeah, I thought it was truth that was stranger than fiction, Bruce. What? Well... You know, you might have a point. Well, that's the first time you've ever given me credit. You better savor this moment, Chad. And Colin, while we have you here, thank you so much for joining us this week. You've added an element of exquisiteness to this program. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Conan. It's not Conan, it's Colin. My name is Colin S. Collins, poet extraordinaire. That's right. (laughs) All righty then. And up next, Nick Redfern joins us with an extremely controversial book, almost as controversial as the name Rocky Stucky. A, A controversial book that I do not agree with. Nonetheless... It does agree with a lot of the Nephilim lunacy and the alien lunacy out there. And we will delve into... And I, by the way, I like a lot of Nick Redford's books. It's just this one, I think, terribly misses the mark. Plus, I'm RH negative. So I've got a dog in this hunt. I'm human, people. I'm human. Watch me bleed. No, let me start over. <laughs> yeah, my son's neg- RH negative, too. So we both have... Tell that on the air, Chad. We both have skin in the game. Yeah, don't don't tell that. Okay, up next, as I said, Nick Redfern joins us with an extremely controversial book that I don't agree with. Nonetheless, it does agree with a lot of the craziness out there, and we will delve into this topic with Nick Redfern, with open books, with open eyes, with open ears, hopefully, in a moment. I love it. That was so sustained. (laughs) Good thing I'm editing. I love it. (laughs) I I love it. That was so sustained. (laughs) I said again. (laughs) Sustained. Okay. Three, two, one. I love it. That was so succinct.
And joining me this week once again is one of my favorite authors, Nick Redfern. Nick Redfern is an author, lecturer, and journalist who writes about a wide range of unsolved mysteries, including Bigfoot, UFOs, the Loch Ness Monster, alien encounters, and government conspiracies. His previous books include Close Encounters of the Fatal Kind, For Nobody's Eyes Only, The World's Weirdest Places, The Pyramids in the Pentagon, The Real Men in Black, The NASA Conspiracies, and Contactees. All great books. Redfern has appeared on numerous television shows and networks, including Fox News, The History Channel's Ancient Aliens, Monster Quest, and UFO Hunters, VH1's Legend Hunters, National Geographic Channel's The Truth About UFOs, and Paranatural, BBC's Out of This World, MSNBC's Countdown, and Sci-Fi Channel's Proof Positive. He can be contacted at nickredfernfordian.blogspot.com. Again, that's Nick Redfern Fordian, F-O-R-T-E-A-N, nickredfernfordian.blogspot.com. His latest book is Bloodline of the Gods, Unravel the Mystery of the Human Blood Type to Reveal the Aliens Among Us, again by Nick Redfern. Nick, welcome back to the Bruce Collins Show. Hey, Bruce. Thanks for having me on again. Well, it's great to always have you on, and uh, you're one of my favorite authors in this uh, genre, oh, you and uh, Micah Hanks. Now, I, I do want to ask you a, a writing question before we get into the book. Uh-huh. Um I heard several years ago Stephen King talking about writing, and he said uh, he, there have been times when he's been writing where he locks himself in, into a room and then he literally l- writes for days. Have you ever done that? No. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I actually take a very sort of down-to-earth approach to it. I, uh, I like to sort of keep regular hours, 8 to 5, and uh, take evenings off take weekends off. I never work evenings or uh, weekends unless I'm really down to a, a deadline, but I like to, in terms of the work, you know, I mean, you've got to have a passion about it, obviously, um, but in terms of actual structuring the work, I like to just keep eight to five, you know, I get up at like seven, have breakfast, and then I, I write from eight to five, and then wherever I am in the Word documents, you know, at that time I stop, yeah. and um, I close it down and then forget about it till eight o'clock the next morning and I think for me I mean that approach doesn't necessarily work for everyone you know some people have a lot of friends who like to work through the night you know they feel kind of inspired to write then Um, you know and I do have some friends who sort of go on marathon binges almost you know where they'll just feel they'll keep going but for me I I feel better writing where you know I, I stop at five and then I have a break until I start again the next morning, and that kind of keeps me energized. You know, I, I prefer that kind of approach. Yeah, that makes sense. Can you give us a general overview of this book, Bloodline of the Gods? Yeah, well, it, it deals with a, an aspect of the phenomenon, the UFO phenomenon, that actually isn't that well known, and also it, it ties in with the alien abduction phenomenon rather than just the UFO phenomenon as a whole. And whenever I'm sort of writing or planning on writing a new book, you know, you want to try and come up with something new for the reader that has, hasn't largely been touched upon before, and certainly not at book length. Um, so I'm always sort of careful and take time to, to try and come up with something that's new and uh, one of the issues that sort of I cross paths with over the years but just in the form where I'd read little articles here and there was the issue of how a small, very small percentage of the human population has blood which falls into a category called RH negative and it's been found over the years that a lot of people who are RH negative have ties to the UFO phenomenon that's to say alien abductees, contactees, had profound UFO encounters, or or even seem sort of almost like eerily drawn to the subject, but they're not sure why. And so the book is a study of, of what RH negative blood is and how and why it, it ties in with the UFO phenomenon and why and how, it, how that came to be. Now, I've noticed that this topic is getting popular even among what I would call Christian fringe groups that talk mm-hmm. about the Nephilim. And they're trying to tie RH negative blood into the Nephilim. Some of them worry me, quite frankly, because they seem to desire to eradicate people with RH negative blood because they say they're unredeemable. 
is there sort of a negative feedback or a negative thought process from the secular world researching this as RH negative alien blood? Well, yeah, I mean, to me, that's taking things not just to the extreme, but, you know, to an, you know, a, an angle that isn't justified even to the slightest degree, you know. I right. mean, although I, I sort of present the arguments that people are of RH negative blood, you know, there are these intriguing ties that, that tie these people to the UFO phenomenon, but that's no reason to, no pun intended, like demonize them or anything like that. <laughs> You know, it just happens to be that's how they're born. They have that that issue, and you know, and often, as I said, it is related to UFOs. It's not like we're talking about an underground army of RH negatives where they all get in collusion, have secret meetings, and they're going to overthrow the planet. You know, it, it's not like that at all. It just means that they may have something unique about them, but it's not something where they're being programmed or controlled or anything like that. They're just regular people like the rest of us. You know. I'm actually, as a point of disclosure, I'm actually RH negative. So, oh, okay. Uh, so if, people, so if pe- people come after me, I'm blaming you. No, just kidding. <laughs> well, that's interesting, you know, because, I, I mean, you just pointed that out, and I said, you know, a lot of people who are involved in this subject are RH negative, and um, whether it is abductees, contactees, or people just drawn to it. Um, and funnily enough, uh, Whitley Streamer had me on his show the other night. He was telling me how his late wife and she was RH negative. So, you know, you find finding this all over the place. So talk about this RH negative blood as being uh, unique. Yeah, I mean, it's actually not that... Um, sort of difficult to understand when you sort of get your head around it but basically there are there are four main primary types of blood a b a b and o so it's a b a b and o and um the the classifications come from what are called the antigens of a person's blood cells and antigens are proteins found on the surface of cells and if you have these antigens you're called rh positive and RH comes, it basically means the rhesus factor, which comes from the rhesus monkey. In other words, you know, we all have this, this lineage, if you like, this, that, that is traceable back. However, there's a small percentage of the population that specifically their blood doesn't contain this antigen, and they're known as the RH negative. Not that they're not called it negative because there's anything wrong with them. Mm-hmm. It just means they, they lack this particular antigen rather than, you know, the positives contain it in their blood. The negatives are called that because they don't have it in their blood. Now, current figures, I mean, it varies, obviously, but approximately, uh, to give you a sort of a, a close to the, uh, you know, the mark figure, in the United States, roughly around about... 13 to 14 percent of the population of the Caucasian population is RH negative. Um, about eight or nine percent of African Americans are RH negative, and around one to two percent of Asian Americans are RH negative. So, in other words, it's a very small percentage of the population, and that makes it all the more intriguing that for a small population, um, there's an incredible number of people who are drawn towards. The UFO subject, and um, and there are a lot of uh, physical differences as well. For example, um, there's a condition. It's it's not um, just exclusive to RH negatives. But there's a condition where people occasionally born with an extra vertebra in their spine. Now, for the most part, this doesn't cause any problems, and most people may not even know they've got an extra vertebra unless they have to have you know some sort of back surgery. Um, however. Um, the number of RH negatives who have an extra vertebra is actually significantly more than in the population at an average level. Uh, typically, they have less tolerance um, to high temperatures and direct sunlight um, than do RH positives. Um, there are also issues like feeling um, sort of somewhat different and as if they have a mission or a task or a, a goal to perform, but they're not able to entirely put their finger on what it is or why. And um, you know, so we, we have a lot of strange things like this, and we, but we see parallels, you know, as I said, between so many of the RH negatives that it, it clearly goes beyond just a coincidence. Mm-hmm. In terms of having an extra vertebrae, I think I'm safe because most people accuse me of not even having a spine. So I think I think that's good. <laughs> now, well, I mean, it's interesting you, you say that. I'll tell you for why, because one of the things I talk about in the book 
is um, the probably the most famous um, alien abduction incident of all time, the Betty and Barney Hill case of 1961. Right. Uh, this couple, Betty and Barney, driving home from a vacation in Canada um, to back to their home in New Hampshire, had this weird experience late at night in September 61, um, knew something strange had happened to them, uh, had these fragments of seeing something in the sky and then the object getting closer and then they started getting weird dreams and nightmares of being taken on board this vehicle and subjected to various um, medical experiments and it's interesting bear in mind this was the early 60s when the hypnosis was going on that they undertook to try and figure out what had happened to them Barney Hill said that when they, him and Betty were on board the craft the, the aliens kept running their fingers down his spine and he felt with hindsight they were counting his vertebra. Now, 1962-63, it was sort of 52 years ago now, nobody was talking about, you know, RH negative blood and extra vertebra in alien abductees back then. I mean, the term alien abductee didn't really exist. And even though the Betty and Barney Hill wasn't the first case, it was certainly the first widely recognized case so it's intriguing that before any of your know, decades before all this stuff surfaced uh, barney hill himself was talking about this extra vertebra angle i imagine this rh negative situation has kind of thrown a monkey wrench in the theory of evolution would that be right yeah that is right because um i mean if you look at it like i said you know it's called the rh factor you know, we were talking about a lineage, you know, the and the whole RH um, uh, factor, the, the blood issue, and the rhesus monkey, or the rhesus macaque, to give it its official title, which it's derived from. And that's why, over the years, so many, uh, unfortunate, but, it, you know, it has been done, sort of medical experiments on animals have been undertaken on rhesus macaques, because, you know, we're so close. So, in other words, if the theory of evolution is 100% correct, then arguably there's no real reason why a small percentage of us shouldn't be the same. You know, it's not like, for example, you know, living today we have Homo sapien and we have Neanderthal man and we have Cro-Magnon. You know, it's just, today it's just Homo sapien. So why is it that, you know, we a small percentage is different. Arguably, we should all be the same. We should all be RH positive. So would it, would we say that these RH negatives could be the result of ET-based genetic manipulation? Well, yeah, that, that's the theory I talk about in the book. For example, and to sort of understand it, we sort of need to go over to um, Spain and portions of France where the Basque people live, that's B-A-S-Q-U-E. Now, the Basque people, you know, I mentioned how for the majority of the world, um, the RH negative numbers are extremely low. For the Basque people of Spain and portions of France, their figures are between 45 and 60 percent RH negative. It's a tremendously high figure. And they have a, a language that is unique totally to them in Europe. You know, if you look at some of the European languages, you can find similar words in, you know, in different countries um, because their borders are so close together. But with the Basque people, there's literally nothing like it at all. It's completely unique. On top of that, the Basque people look quite different to the rest of us. And I don't mean that, you know, in a <laughs> disrespectful way, but they do. They have sort of um, heavier foreheads, wider noses, sort of more pronounced jaws, and their bodies are bulkier. And what's interesting is that in the areas where the Basques lived, that's where Cro-Magnon man used to live sort of 35, 48,000 years ago. And we find other parts of the world where the Cro-Magnons lived. And today, the RH negative levels are higher there as well. And studies of these comparisons and percentages strongly suggest that Cro-Magnon man was itself um, RH negative. And what we're seeing today with people like the Basques are sort of the, you know, the the last, if you like, um, offshoot um, of Cro-Magnons. And so then we get into these stories that, you know, there's quite a lot of these stories proliferating in various UFO literature of how potentially ancient visiting extraterrestrials wanted to create, if you like, a kind of slave race on the Earth. And so they genetically 
uh, mutated an early form of human into uh, Cro-Magnon Man, which would be sort of very robust, strong, actually had a high degree of intelligence as well, and which would have made the ideal slave race. And that over time, as I said, became the Cro-Magnon, and then when potentially at least these extraterrestrials left, or significant amounts of them left, the Cro-Magnons then became, you know, sort of the dominating factor over the Neanderthals who died out, and, and that's why we have this anomaly under a small percentage of the population, because it's sort of a bloodline running through in a small percentage, dating back when all this manipulation was going on. What about the Anunnaki and the CIA? Oh, yeah, that's a weird story. I mean, again, that, that sort of goes back to the whole issue of why the Anunnaki was supposedly coming here, which I'll explain that first because it will help people to understand um, this issue of the CIA. Now, the, the prevailing theory is that there were problems with the Anunnaki's home planet. Uh, some people call it Nibiru. Other people have suggested that, you know, we're not really sure where it is, if it was even in our solar system or not. But the prevailing theory is that in the same way today our world has at times you know had problems with its ozone layer but um, their world did as well now the theory that's been put forward is that the Anunnaki created this slave race essentially to mine for gold and the reason being to essentially turn this gold into you know literally billions of minute particles which would be released into the atmosphere of their planet to essentially block holes in their equivalent of the ozone layer now before people you know might think that sounds like science fiction it's important to note that back in the 1970s the legendary physicist dr edward teller he actually came up with this idea the idea to create particles of heavy metals including gold and then which would be could be released into the higher levels of the atmosphere uh, to create a kind of shield like defense against deadly ozone um, and you can actually find, um, you know, Dr. Teller's, uh, I won't say patents, but it was an idea that he came up with that it would help, you know, offset these problems. So in other words, what Dr. Teller, you know, one of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century came up with may have been something similar to what the Anunnaki came up with. Now, so bear in mind we have this issue where the, you know, as I said, one of the prevailing theories is that the Anunnaki created this slave race to mine for gold on the planet on a massive scale. What we find is that in the early 50s, through the Freedom of Information Act, I got a number of documents showing how um, in the early 50s, a lot of flying saucers were being seen around Belgian um, Belgian Congo, I should say, uranium mines. And what's interesting is the Belgian Congo is one of the areas where, and, and other portions of Africa, where supposedly these mining operations were going on tens of thousands of years ago. And then we find out that the CIA is monitoring reports of UFOs seen in the vicinity of these uranium mines today. And it turns out I found some other documents from 1949 where UFOs were seen in relation to uranium mines and as I um, filed for those re records and additional ones one of the documents contained a reference to how it was being recommended within the CIA that there should be not just the uranium mines should be watched for UFO activity but the gold mines in Africa as well so in other words we've got this story which you know has actually only surfaced in the last decade or two of the Anunnaki and mining for gold but now we've got freedom of information document for documents from the early 50s talking about the intelligence community saying, hey, you know, we need to monitor uh, the UFO phenomenon for any uh, um, activity in the vicinity of gold mines. So it kind of suggests that whether they had all the answers or not, which I doubt, but somebody had made this connection decades ago in around 51 well actually no 49 was as I said the earliest documents ago through 53 somebody was taking note of this gold slash flying saucer connection and what's in your book bloodline of the gods by uh, of course by Nick Redfern what is the significance of the mythos of fairies mm. 
Well, yeah, I mean, when people talk about fairies for the most part today, they think of little sort of uh, tiny female characters with wings, you know, mm. shiny and sparkling and flying around the Christmas tree or whatever, you know. But if you look back, if you go back into sort of uh, 15th, 16th century Celtic teachings and, you know, European law, folklore, that kind of thing, the fairies then were very different. They were sort of described as three-foot-tall entities. They would live deep underground in sort of winding caverns, caves, and, and mounds and things, kind of like the Native American mounds that you see across the United States, but with sort of large networks of tunnels. And they were sort of perceived as magical creatures that could be friendly, playful, but also vindictive and deadly, depending on you know how the matter took them. But what's interesting, and this draws parallels with today's abductions, and bear in mind, you know, the, the height of the creatures, sort of three feet tall, ties in with the greys. You have a lot of um, stories um, within a Middle Ages folklore of, for example, a man walking through the woods and he sees these lights that became known as fairy lights, which you could interpret as UFOs. Mm -hmm. Then he gets taken to the fairy kingdom where he has to have sex with the fairy queen because the fairy population is blighted and their numbers are dwindling and they have to um, in, you know, create new blood, so to speak, almost literally. Um, and then when the man is returned to our world, he finds sort of two days has gone by when he thought two hours had gone by. And also these dwarfish things, become, that over time have become known as fairies, would break into people's homes at night and steal babies and replace them with what were called changelings, like a wooden effigy of... Um, of a baby. So in other words, we have a lot of the components of today's abductions. We have the dwarf-like figures, we have the sexual reproduction angle, um, we have the missing time, we have the UFO with the fairy lights, and we have with these sort of effigies, as I said, and stealing babies. This brings to mind the whole issue of hybrid babies and hybrid children that get spoken about in today's ufology. So I, you know, I point out that we have like a, an ongoing lineage from the era of the Anunnaki, the very earliest times, to the sort of so-called men of renown in the Bible, and the Nephilim, and these uh, humans with extend extensive lifespans, then right through to these, you know, in simple terms today, what we would call fairy stories, and right through to alien abductions. It suggests an ongoing operation, but, you know, on a more stealthy level than tens of thousands of years ago. Okay, so the thought is that many, many years ago, uh, the, the genetically manipulated humanoids and mm. made them sort of a slave class. Why mm. would they be abducting RH negatives today? Well, that, that's a good question. I and mean, actually, my answer to that question, I think it's almost like a situation where the tables are turning. I mean, for example... Way back when, and you know, when the Anunnaki reportedly first came here, they were obviously the ones in control. They were, you know, pulling the strings and running the show, and doing so on a massive scale. And we were literally, you know, their slaves to essentially whatever we did. If they wanted us to do, you know, we would have to do. But um, it seems possible to me, at least, from looking at the accounts that things have changed significantly at some point in the last sort of, you know, who knows, 1,500 years, 1,000 years, to where if we look at today's abduction stories, there are good indications that much of the abduction issue and, you know, the changelings and um, the hybrid children, hybrid babies, it suggests to me at least and to a lot of people that these entities are on a like an evolutionary decline today. You know, one, at one point in the distant past when they could have been perceived as, you know, literal gods. Today, things have changed and they're, they're on a decline. So where in the past they used us for a slave race, today, essentially, they're using our DNA, sperm, eggs, everything else, essentially to ensure their survival. You know, it's a case of trying to splice them with us to ensure they can stay, can stay alive. You know, it's a... Like I said before, you're injecting new blood, so to speak. And it's conceivable that this is not even the same race, correct? Well, yeah. I mean, admittedly, you know, as I point out, um, we could be dealing with sort of multiple factions, or, you know, it could be the same ones, as I said, left behind sort of a, you know, a caretaker race while the 
you know, the rest left and went back to their home world. We just, we just really don't know. But what we can say for sure is that in the same way that in the very distant past, you know, we had the stories of the gods coming down and mating with human women and, as I said, the Nephilim and all that kind of stuff. And today we have something very similar, but it's not being done in sort of, you know, in the open. What Because, I mean, if it was still being done, if it was being done as stealthy back then as it was today, we, we wouldn't have these stories all around the world probably. But the fact that we do demonstrates that it was a... You know, it wasn't something they were hiding. It was something that was being done, in, you know, in the open, in plain sight. But today, that's different. So we could be looking at different entities. I also speculate in the book the idea of a sort of a caretaker race of, I mean, if you like, biological drones designed and created and programmed to perform these ongoing tasks of, you know, of abducting people, um, taking whatever they need, the DNA, the genetic material, etc., and that might explain, if you like, the kind of robotic, drone-like way in which the greys act. You know, they, they actually don't seem like independent life forms. They're almost like sort of worker ants or something like that, like soldier ants, where they just perform one task endlessly over and over again. You know, the thing I like about your books and, and Micah Hanks is that you kind of present a lot of different possibilities. But there are some people, as you know, who will remain nameless in different factions, say conspiracies or paranormal or UFOs, and they seem to be sensationalistic. Any chance they could be RH negative and therefore disinfo agents? Uh, well, I mean, that's an interesting theory. I mean, I've never sort of looked at the whole issue of, you know, people who've been tied with... Um, you know, disinformation programs might be RH negative. I mean, I haven't thought about that, but that's actually an interesting area. But, um, yeah, I mean, when it comes to, I mean, not want to sort of sensationalize things, you know, I, I point out that what we have here are theories. But whenever I discuss a theory, I try and demonstrate how uh, and when, you know, there's data that backs up the theory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's like, for example, the when people say, well, it's a theory that the RH negatives, excuse me, that the Crow magnons were RH negative. Yes, it is. But, you know, I would then say, but we can actually add weight to the theory by the fact that in today's world, where RH negatives proliferate at a high level, that's where the Crow magnons proliferated as well. You know, and we, and we find similarities to that, you know, not just in, in Spain. Um, and France, you know, the, the, the other areas where Cro-Magnons were, you know, in, in, in extensive numbers, the same is found there. So, in other words, when I try and find, um, you know, evidence of, uh, to support a theory, you know, I present the evidence to demonstrate that theory does have merit to it. You know. Yeah, and if you ever want to know more about the Cro-Magnons, just ask my relatives. Now, when we look at conspiracy for instance one of the things i always hear in the conspiracy world is all the politicians are related to each other and it's interesting because i think there are some cousins in there where this person is a you know a 19th supposedly trump is a 19th uh, level cousin to hillary clinton which mm -hmm. is an interesting theory but your book points out that it's it's possible that there's a connection between all of these powerful people through their blood type, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting thing, how, for example, a number of presidents have been RH negative, how significant numbers of the British royal family are RH negative, and even probably the world, you know, one of the most infamous characters of the 20th century, Lee Harvey Oswald, was RH negative. Hmm. Uh, so, in other words, you know, he wasn't a world leader, but, you know, he actually influenced the nature of, you know, the, the history of the U.S. presidency, he, you know, he by cutting down President Kennedy, if it was him, you know, um, or just him alone or not. Um, so, in other words, we have a lot of RH negatives playing significant roles in the development of history and modern-day society and civilization. And I don't think that's coincidence. And this sort of brings up something I talk about in the book, namely the idea that if the Anunnaki did leave, but left behind them some sort of caretaker base of operations to continue this genetic um, experimentation, possibly, as I said, in later years for their own survival, well, you know, they might want to leave some sort of evidence 
of or aspect of, of who they were behind. So even if they left, what better way to continue to rule the planet but to do so, if you like, by proxy? You know, they're not sort of literally ruling the planet where we're seeing them, you know, flying around every day and controlling our lives, but to do so by proxy, by, if you like, using an elite that continue this bloodline throughout the millennia and the centuries and the decades. And so, in essence, in a strange, as I said, by proxy fashion, the, the Anunnaki are still actually, you know, running the planet, but mm -hmm. they're doing so via people who, at a, at a very small percentage and a, you know, a small genetic degree, are, want of a better term, hybrids themselves. Right, and then the question would be, would, do those people realize they're doing that? Ah, well, that's the big question. Now, in some of the more sort of conspiratorial, paranoid aspects of the phenomenon, there are people who say that, you know, that a lot of the RH negatives know and they're in collusion. You know, personally, I don't think that. I, th I think there is something to this idea of, like, um, an elite bloodline that's carefully preserved amongst, for example, like, powerful figures and royalty. No, you know, it's not like somebody's next-door neighbor's RH negative and they're phoning you because you're RH negative, you know, and we're going to we're gonna move tomorrow. That, you know, yeah, it's not, exactly. no, that's not happening at all. <laughs> you know, it's not like there are millions of RH negatives around the planet all stealthily planning and plotting for the day when the Anunnaki are going to come back. No, most people, you know, if they haven't had their blood ever, group ever checked, wouldn't even know they're RH negative. You know, they might feel drawn to the UFO phenomenon or they may have had weird experiences, but they're not part of some sinister elite. I suspect the people who do fall into the category you're talking about may be the ones who've been briefed and who are in, who know the deep, dark secret about what all this means and implies. So in other words, it's not like their brain is being controlled some way by extraterrestrials. No, most people would be on you know, totally unaware that there's an actual reason why they might be interested in UFOs. I want to alert people to my new book, The Walking RH Negatives. But until that becomes published, <laughs> in the meantime, please purchase Nick Redfern's book, Bloodline of the Gods, Unravel the Mystery of the Human Blood Type to Reveal the Aliens Among Us. Again, Bloodline of the Gods by Nick Redfern. Nick Redfern is at nickredfern14.blogspot.com. One thing that's been a real popular topic is black-eyed children. And I notice in your book, Bloodline of the Gods, you discuss black-eyed children. How do they fit into this whole RH negative story? Well, yeah, I mean, this is interesting because, again, I talk about RH negatives and in conjunction with sightings of black-eyed children. Now, I'm sure most of your listeners have heard of the black-eyed children, but for the probably small number who haven't, certainly in the last sort of six, seven years or so, this phenomenon's become more and more prevalent mm -hmm. all around the world of people seeing um, children, it's usually boys, but not always, um, somewhere around about the age of 11 to about 13 or 14, and they're typically described as having had very pale skin, generally dressed in black hoodies, with the hoods always up and pulled down tight. Um, usually seen late at night, and they try and get force their way into people's homes, try and make excuses like, you know, we're lost, or we need some money, can we call our parents? And most people never, if, if ever, there, there are very few reports of people actually allowing these entities in their home. Um, but the main reason people don't is when they see their eyes, which are described as literally totally black. I mean, I don't just mean the, you know, the center part of the eye. The entire, including the white of the eye, is totally black. And possibly that's one of the reasons they wear the hoodies and come out at night and typically talk to people with their heads pointed downwards because they're trying to camouflage the fact that they look slightly different to the rest of us. Now, what's interesting, you know, we mentioned Betty and Barney Hill earlier. Well, when the abduction phenomenon kicked off with them in the early 60s, it was chiefly, you know, sort of weird dreams and vague references to... Uh, medical experimentation and a suggestion of sort of a reproductive angle. Then in the 70s, it picked up slightly more. And then certainly in the 80s, the whole issue of the reproductive angle uh, really took off. But then in the early 90s, we started to hear more and more reports of hybrid babies being seen, like people, women predominantly seeing 
on board UFOs or again in underground installations, like hybrid babies, you know, in these endless tanks of liquid um, that look sort of part human and part alien. And then today, it's like the experiments, you know, the experiments, I would say they began in the 60s, they clearly didn't. But we're seeing like a development of tentative abductions in the 60s to a genetic angle in the 80s, then hybrid babies in the 90s. And now we're seeing these things, you know, late at night on the streets and possibly even infiltrating us and that you know the word infiltration could be interpreted as a sinister angle some researchers do believe it's a, it's a sinister phenomenon in other words we seem like a progression and like for example dr david jacobs he believes that um you know the whole issue of these hybrids is to create a sinister race of extraterrestrials that are so close to us eventually that they will be able to move amongst us and manipulate us and um and the, the black-eyed children appear to be sort of the latest line in this ongoing phenomenon. Hmm. So you sort of touched on it just now, but where do you think all of this research and the whole story of RH negative, where do you think this is headed? Well, that's a good question because, I mean, you know, I, I point out this in the book in the conclusion, you know, what would the outcome be if a small percentage of the human population was shown to have a bloodline that was manipulated by extraterrestrials in the distant past. Now, I think, you know, if it was proved, I think most people would be, wow, you know, we're, we're the product of extraterrestrials. Mm-hmm. I, th- I actually do think in today's world, you know, filled with paranoia and everything else, a small percentage of the population might view the RH negatives with suspicion. Now, personally, I don't think it's warranted because, as I said, you know, it's not like they're all some underground army all in collusion, you know, having secret phone calls at midnight or anything like that. You know, that they're unknowingly, if they're extraterrestrial, they're, for the most part, unknowingly extraterrestrial, you know, or extra- extraterrestrial aspect to them. Um, but I could understand, although I certainly wouldn't endorse, I could understand how some people might feel suspicious. And I think possibly we could have sort of over the top demands, you know, well, are these people safe, etc. Kind of like the analogy when, um, you know, I mean, I remember this particularly because it happened right by me, when the Ebola thing broke out in Dallas, you know, not that long ago. Um, but, so you know, we sometimes have short memories, and one of the reasons we have short memories of Ebola is that we had the one guy who flew into the U.S., came to Dallas, died. Um, but then the two nurses uh, contracted it, but they both recovered. But at the time when the nurses went down and the guy was dying... I mean, you can find the story still on the internet. People saying, you know, Dallas has got to be placed in lockdown, quarantined, and mm-hmm. martial law and emergency laws have got to be put into place to keep these people, the infected, away from the rest of us. I mean, it sounded like The Walking Dead or World War Z or something, yeah. you know. And then it all came to an end because, you know, yes, the guy unfortunately died, but the two nurses recovered, and that was the end of the Ebola apocalypse. There was no apocalypse. But I can see how when all the hysteria broke out with that, I think a small percentage of the population might take that sort of same view. Now, I don't think it's warranted, as I said, but being, you know, human nature being what it is, I think you would see some of the screaming, um, you know, other top people demanding this and demanding that. Oh, sure. Anytime there's a perceived threat, whether real or not, people are going to react in some way. You could almost see, like, um, you know, when... I mean, this is an extreme, but when Hitler blamed the Jews, the Jews had to wear the Star of David on their shirts and and all of that and were put in certain areas of town. You could see that. I mean, granted, that may not be an outcome, but that's one of the more uh, speculative, sensationalistic uh, reactions. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's interesting you bring that up because, I mean, you know, the Jews are just like the rest of us. They're all human. And yeah. yet somebody, you know, this crazy guy, Adolf Hitler, decided otherwise that, you know, we're all homo sapiens, but he decided this one particular group have got to be gone. So, you know, the disturbing thing is there is a precedent for this sort of, you know, terrible behavior. Yeah, and it is funny we mentioned them because there are some people that still to this day believe that they're the ruling class. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I think a lot of people take the view that, I mean, presidents, prime ministers, etc., 
are, for all intents and purposes, often like a figurehead. Yeah. And, you know, the world's real controllers and manipulators are, you know, the, the rich, powerful ancient families, the banking communities, the people who sort of pull the strings in the shadows and get things done um, behind the scenes. And, um, you know, that that's what I think is intriguing about the RH negative angle, how we find, like I said, with the royals, you yeah. know, we're talking about, ancient powerful families with long lineages and heritage etc and to me that makes far more sense um, you know the idea that you could have some sort of like an ancient offshoot of the Anunnaki as I said still ruling by proxy but not in plain sight you know it would be it would be amongst the sort of power elite rather than the average person so to speak yeah I often wonder about conspiracies as far as how organized they really are because everything seems so screwed up. But then again, then then people say that's an organized screw up. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the I mean, that's the one main downside with conspiracy theories is that you know you start digging into them and it leads here and then it leads there and then it leads into another conspiracy theory and another. Uh, what began as one conspiracy actually mutates and expands into who knows how many. And, and then it becomes so complicated that, um, you know, it becomes difficult to put a full yeah. handle on exactly what's going on. Exactly. Now, this book is Bloodline of the Gods by Nick Redfern. But before you go, I, I always know one thing about Nick Redfern. He's always working on a lot of projects, and he has a lot of books out. Do you have other books out right now that you could kind of tease that maybe if people want to buy multiple Nick Redfern books that they could also purchase these? Don't you have a Chupacabra book out? Yeah, well, what's happened? I'm always working on a couple of books, and, and I guess after 20 years of writing books, it would be inevitable that at one point, you know, somebody's going to put out a, a one company, because I'm with several companies, it's yeah. inevitable that one company's going to put out a book at the same time as another company. But what actually happened is that there are three companies, different companies that have put out books right now from me. Um, New Page Books have published the one we've been speaking about right now, Bloodline of the Gods. But I've also got one with Llewellyn Books, which is called Chupacabra Road Trip, which is it's a very different book in terms of style to Bloodline of the Gods because it's sort of written in a diary format. and It's a, it's a diary of all my ten years of traveling around Puerto Rico, Mexico, and the U.S. in search of the Chupacabra. You know, so it's written in the form of like a diary. You know, it was, it was a dark and stormy night at midnight, and I jumped in the Jeep <laughs> and headed off into the rainforest. That, that's how that book's sort of written, like an on-the-road trip, mm -hmm. hence the title, Chupacabra Road Trip. And the other one um, is called uh, The Bigfoot Book. It's an A to Z book published by Visible Ink Press, and it's, um, I say it's like an A to Z style with 200 entries on everything to do with Bigfoot, so you've got entries on like Bigfoot, the Abominable Snowman, um, the Orang Pendek of Sumatra, and lesser known ape men type creatures around the world, and also entries on, for example, uh, Bigfoot and UFOs, and reports where people have said Bigfoot's become invisible, or Bigfoot's psychically spoken to them, so there's like the psychic Bigfoot. So, in other words, it's like, as I said, 200 entries, uh, A to Z style, of uh, every, just about everything to do with Bigfoot. Excellent. And again, we've been speaking specifically tonight about the book Bloodline of the Gods, Unravel the Mystery of the Human Blood Type to Reveal the Aliens Among Us by Nick Redfern, one of the uh, best authors in this field. Nick, thank you so much for joining us this week, and I hope you can join us again sometime. Yeah, well, I definitely will, Bruce, and thanks for having me on the show again. appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Bruce Collins Show, where you can find us every Friday night at midnight here at WWPR, 1490 AM. Remember, God loves you. We do too. Don't give up.